passage, which is tough. This is a very tough passage. So I'm going to ask God to help me, to help you, to hear God's word. Let's pray. Lord, you love us, you love us enough to tell us the truth. So help us to listen, even when that truth is sometimes uncomfortable. Amen. You know those, um, those bad news, good news kind of jokes, don't you? The, the, the sort that goes, um, I borrowed your car yesterday and I've got good news and bad news. So what's the good news? Well, the airbags worked perfectly. The, these, these jokes often involve a doctor and a patient, don't they? Doctor. Uh, do you want to hear the good news or the bad news? The patient, uh, good news please doctor. Doctor, they're going to name a disease after you. Do you know, I had a, I had a good news, bad news kind of doctor-patient story last year, personally, at the Westbourne Medical Center. I, I wanted the doctor to have a look at, at both my ankles because the right one was persistently and obviously swollen. So the doctor had sent me to have both ankles x-rayed at the Royal Bournemouth here, and I was back for the results. So, Mr. Baker, said the doctor, do you want the bad news or the good news? Uh, Well, look, doc, because I'm quite friendly with him. Look, doc, give give me the bad news first. Well... Look, the bad news is your right ankle is shot. It's arthritic. Uh, You've got bits of bone floating around inside. Okay, so what's the good news? Well, you've got two feet, and your left ankle is fine, so you can hop. (laughs) He's got a lovely bedside manner, has my my doctor. We We all want to hear the good news, don't we? Of course we do. And the Apostle Paul has, has, has wonderfully good news to share with us in this letter to the Romans that we're, we're looking at in our series, More Than Conquerors. And he summarized that good news in our motto text for 2020. Do you remember it a few weeks ago? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. That is good news. The gospel is powerful to save everyone who believes in Jesus. Why is it powerful though? Well, if you look at your Bibles in Romans 1, look at the next verse, after verse 16. Why is it powerful? Because Paul says, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. God has provided a way for people like us to be made right with him. That is good news. Now, here comes the bad news with which, in fact, we began last Sunday morning's message. Verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. So are you with me? The good news only makes sense when we grasp the bad news of God's judgment. And that is the intention, the direction of travel of this morning's passage in Romans 2. Until we realize the danger that we are in, we are not likely to understand that we need to be rescued. Through faith in Jesus we can be in a right relationship to God. Great news. But why do I need to be right with God? Here's the bad news. Because I am facing his judgment now and in the future. So look into chapter 2, which Rebecca read just now, and verse 5, if you want to hang uh, our thoughts on that. You are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment 
will be revealed. So notice two things. It says Paul in chapter 1 verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed now in the present and the wrath of God will be revealed then in the future. Now, now that, that word wrath alongside God's name, it can, it can confuse us, can't it? But, but don't think of that word in connection with God in terms of human anger. When we are angry, nine times out of ten, frankly, we're out of control. God's wrath is his settled, consistent commitment to righteousness in the face of sin and evil. Let me put it like this. God wants justice for the world. God wants to put things right. That's his character. And what Paul does in in chapter 2 through to the end of chapter 3 is to show that because we are all facing the righteous judgment of a holy God, we all need the gospel. All of us. Jew, Gentile, moral, religious or not, with or without a Bible. Do you see how Paul in chapter 2 and 3 closes off all the escape hatches Uh, Miles will be picking this up next week, but Romans 3 verse 9, Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin, 3.9. 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. 3.12, there is no one who does good, not even one. And finally, the punchline, 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In comparison, you see, to God's perfection and glory, we all fall far short. All of us, even the best of us. So that's where we're headed this morning, okay? We all need to be saved because we are all under judgment. And only the gospel of Jesus has power to save us. All right, let's back up to verse 1 of chapter 2. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Now, we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? So here's my first main point. There is a judgment for all and there are no excuses. There are no excuses. Now... Who's Paul's target audience there? Well, those who think that the catalog of sins that he's recorded in the previous chapter gives them the excuse to say, well, I'm better than them, so I'm not facing judgment. Better than who? Well, look back into chapter 1 to those referred to in verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Those referred to in verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even the women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. And verse 28, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. Now, now, did you notice the thrice repeated expression? God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them over. That, you see, is the judgment of God being revealed in the present. God hands people over to the consequences of living without him and his truth at the center of life. And when that happens... This happens. 
idolatry and immorality. People live with the destructive effects of not having God and his truth at the center of their lives. They worship created things that can't truly satisfy And they pursue wrong relationships which don't reflect God's best for us in creation. But I want you really to hear this. Though God gives us up to our sin, he never ever gives up on us in our sin. That is so important that you understand that. Because that's the gospel. The gospel of grace. Though he gives us up to our sin, he never gives up on us in our sin. So at the start of chapter 2, Paul is gunning for those who think that because they are not headline sinners, like the Harvey Weinsteins and Jimmy Savills of this world, because they are not tabloid headline sinners, that they will be therefore excused God's judgment. In other words, Paul is talking probably to people like us, moralists, the good living, respectable and upright, who might say, these people who have done those things deserve God's judgment for their wickedness, but I've got a free pass. No, you haven't, says Paul in chapter 2 and verse 1. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. Paul's target, you see, is that terrible human tendency to be critical of everybody else's misbehavior, but lenient towards our own. To condemn in others what we excuse in ourselves. Let me give you a kind of silly example with Sean down here at the front. I can get really frustrated with Sean sometimes for forgetting where she's put the car keys again. Yet when I do exactly the same thing, my excuse is, ah, I've just been so busy today. It is trivial. So let's raise the stakes as Paul does. From chapter 1, verse 29. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love. No mercy. There are no Premier League sins there. No idolatry or immorality there. But Paul is calling out deceit and malice, the envious, the gossips, the self important, the arrogant, the loveless, the merciless. We are going to be judged for those things, says Paul. And when I read that list, I I say to myself, hey, do you know what? I know people like that. I read about them in the newspaper, and sometimes I meet them, I meet them in the street. In fact, I had an email from someone like that the other day. But that's not the most worrying thing. The really alarming thing is that sometimes I see a person like that, not out in the street, but when I look in the mirror. You see, it's not that some of us are worse than others, but that all of us are sinners. We are all broken. Vaughan Roberts, the respected evangelical leader and vicar of St. Ebbs in Oxford. He writes these powerful words out of his own struggle with same-sex attraction. The brokenness of the fallen world 
writes Vaughan Roberts, afflicts us all in various ways. We'll be conscious of different battles to varying degrees, at different moments of a day, and in different seasons of our lives. No one battle of the many we face, however strongly, defines us, but our identity as Christians flows rather from our relationship with Christ. Folks, you may not be carrying the baggage of a difficult divorce. You may not be battling with serious addictions. But maybe your sin pattern is that you are self-important. That you are self-righteous. That you condemn sin in others but minimize your own. So we have no excuse. None of us. We have no excuse. None of us will escape God's judgment. And we need to be careful of living with that false sense of assurance. Which is why Paul warns the moral and respectable against it. There in verse 4 of chapter 2. Do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you uh, to repentance? Just because God doesn't judge you now for your envy or self-importance or greed doesn't mean you're in the clear. We are not to mistake God's kindness for his approval. We're not to mistake God's amazing patience with us for his weakness not to judge. He will. God's patience will run out. But right now, God is giving us time to get our mess together. God could have blown us out of the water a long time ago. But he's incredibly kind and loving. He wants us to come to our senses, to use the Bible word there, to repent before it's too late. Repentance is the key to a Christian life. And hear me, we don't just repent once. It's a daily thing. Well, at least it is in my life. So when someone says, I repented 20 years ago when I gave my life to Christ, it's done and dusted, I'm sure that may have been true, but it's not done and dusted. Repentance is the ongoing journey of our Christian lives. We've got stuff to sort out with God all the time. I have. So there it is. A judgment for all, no excuses. Secondly, a judgment based on works, no exceptions. God, says Paul from verse 6, God will judge everyone fairly on the basis of what they have done. Now, we evangelicals who know that the gospel is about faith in Jesus and not good works, can get our knickers in a bit of a twist about that. We can get a little bit confused when we read verses 6 to 8. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who persist in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there'll be wrath and anger. So apparently then, it's not just faith in Jesus that matters. Works do too. Actually, in his New Testament letter, James says that faith without works is not faith at all. We are saved by Trusting in God's gospel that Jesus, the crucified Galilean, is the Christ, the promised Savior King, our risen Lord, and the divine judge of all. We are saved by trusting in him. Correct. Tick the box. But many Christians then 
clumsily assume that we are saved by faith without any need for good works to qualify us for heaven. But that isn't what Paul is saying here. So read on into verses 9 and 11. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favorites, show favoritism. There are no exceptions. Paul says, in other words, it does matter how we live. God will judge everyone by what they've done. He will reward how they've lived. And if anybody has lived a good life, then eternal life awaits them at the judgment. But if the direction of their life has been self-seeking, disobedience to the truth, they're in trouble. So if this morning you're a good person, there's nothing to worry about. You'll go to heaven. Conversely, verse 8, for those who are self-seeking, here this morning and following evil, they'll be wrath to face and no exceptions, no favorites. There is a judgment based on works and it's the same for everyone. (laughs) But if that is so, and if as Paul will go on to say, no one is righteous, no one does good, then who can be saved? Who can go to heaven? Who can face the judgment of God unafraid? If it's good to be good, yet no one is ever going to be good enough to qualify for God's righteousness and escape his judgment now or in the future, what's the answer? We're caught. Before we come to the answer, let me illustrate the problem a bit more. Let's imagine today, I know it's not a terribly sunny, warm day, but imagine today, it's actually quite pleasant. It's like a summer day here on the south coast. And so we change our plans on Sunday after the service, and we head off down to Bournemouth Seafront with our swimming costumes, and we decide that because it's such a lovely day, we're all going to swim to New York. Okay, so we set off from the beach. But because some of us are unfit or we've got a bad dodgy right ankle, we don't get more than a few hundred yards into the bay before before we're in trouble. Others like, I don't know, and Lawrence I think is here this morning, Lawrence Hodge. People like Lawrence Hodge and Mary Navy who swim every day through the year, whatever the temperature of the water, they might make it as far as, I don't know, Hanksbury Head? And then there's some in, in Lansdowne, a bit like Andy Finley, who's a, one of those super fit ultra marathon runners. Andy and co. might make it over to the Isle of Wight. But in the end, whether you are in the water for a long or a short time, whether you swim a long way or just a few meters, whether you are a rubbish swimmer or a triathlete, in the end, everybody drowns. Now, certainly you might enjoy the swim, For longer, if you're a strong swimmer, but in the end, everyone is in the same boat or not in a boat, and that's half the problem. We will all drown. No one makes it to New York. You see, Paul's point is not to diminish the value of good deeds, to say that a moral life doesn't matter. But he is saying that if we rely on that moral life to qualify us with God to escape his judgment then we're going to sink we're not going to make it we're in for a shock thirdly from verse 12 there is a judgment with or without the law and there are no exemptions verse 12 All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. 
Paul is referring there to the Gentiles who don't have the Torah, the law of God, and he's referring to the Jews who do. And he says, look, it doesn't matter whether you've got the law, whether you haven't got the law, whether you have a Bible or you don't know the Bible. Both will be judged by their failure to live by the light of their own law. The Gentiles, by the law of their own conscience, written in their hearts. That's true, isn't it? That's true. Everyone has something of the moral imprint of God the creator in their humanity. We live, don't we, with a sense of right or wrong. You you, you don't need to have read a Bible for that. Every society in our world, even the most primitive, has its defined laws where murder is, is deemed to be wrong, where adultery is wrong, where protecting children and the weak and the elderly is right. You will find people in your office this week who have absolutely no Christian background at all and they will say about some media report of child abuse or sex trafficking or genocide, that is simply not right. It's out of order. Where does that come from? It comes from the conscience. The kind of thing that God has written into our the imprint of our, our, our hearts and minds. But it, it, it applies not just to, the, to those kind of big issues. Every one of us carries around a, a conscience about our own smaller personal failures. We sense our failure, don't we, to, to live up to the best version of ourselves. Uh, to, 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 we, to the right, best way to think and act. That's your conscience. Mind you, Mind you, human conscience is not an infallible guide. It's more like an internal compass giving us the general directions on how to live rather than one of those GPS positioning satellites which gives us exact moral coordinates. And here's another thing about the conscience. Your conscience does not have the capacity to keep you from messing up. It's it's only a voice telling us what to do or not to do. Of course, we often can dial down, silence the voice of conscience, rather like disconnecting the batteries from a smoke alarm so that we conveniently don't hear the noise. But you see, the conscience is not a power that helps us to do the right or avoid the wrong. Conscience can condemn us, but it has no power to free us. Freedom from guilt must come some other way. The point here is this. We will all be judged by law, either by the law of God written in his word or by the law of God written in our hearts. And there are no exemptions from that. Got it? Finally. Finally, there is to be a judgment by Jesus and there are no evasions. Verse 16, the last verse we read. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. There is no gospel without judgment in fact if the gospel doesn't include that day of reckoning then the death of Jesus on the cross for us doesn't really make much sense at all actually if you think about it we all believe in judgment we all long for justice in a world where it's hard to come by so according to Verse 16, we can be confident that a day is coming when we will get all the justice that we need and deserve. And that will be not only a universal justice, says Paul there, the final judgment will be individual. It will be personal. It will include what? It will include the secrets of our hearts, the hidden areas 
of our lives. The secrets that no one else this morning knows about. And says Paul, Jesus will be the one who executes that judgment. He will judge not only what we have done, but why we have done it. Because he knows us. He scrutinizes our motives, the secrets of our hearts. He knows everything with perfect, complete recall. All the thoughts and words that we've long forgotten, he remembers. All the deeds done in the dark when we thought no one was looking, he was there. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. Jesus, the judge, is judged in our place. That's the good news. Remember I said that we we need a cure for a, a condemning conscience because our conscience is powerless to rescue us. Remember I said we need an answer to the problem that there is no one good, no not one. That all have sinned and that therefore all face judgment. That there are no excuses, no exceptions, no exemptions and no evasions. So here's the good news. At the cross, Jesus, the perfect righteousness of God, takes on himself the judgment against our sin. We're going to sing in a moment. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. That's why Jesus died. That's the gospel. That's why the gospel is powerful to save sinners facing judgment. Jesus, the judge, is judged in our place. Have you ever heard of a judge who passed sentence and then paid the fine? I have only once. When a woman who stole the milk from doorsteps, which shows how old the story is, to feed her poor children was then fined for theft and the magistrate offered to pay the fine. I can find no other illustrations of such a thing anywhere. Why not? Because judges do not pay criminals fines. It just doesn't happen. Judges judge. They don't embrace the judgment for the judged But one did. God did it for you and me in Jesus. Again, that older hymn, in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a savior. That's amazing. But that, you see, is the only way. If we ever want to be in a a right relationship to God, however moral we've been, however many our good works, we need the righteousness of Christ to qualify us. And here's what happens. When sinners like us facing judgment trust the one who was judged in our place, here's what happens. The verdict of God on that last and final day is brought forward into the present day. We are declared by God to be in the right with him now because of Jesus. We don't need to wait until the final day to know what God will say over our lives as we trust in Jesus. The technical word for all of that is the word justified. It is essentially a legal public declaration. And it's saying that God relates to us because of Jesus in a new way. It's a change of status. Michael and Rebecca had a similar thing happen to them 
in Glasgow two weeks ago. Something became true of them then, which was not true before, and it's changed everything forever in their lives. Now, I know that Rebecca yesterday wanted to wear her wedding dress again, and Michael wanted to wear his three-piece suit again. I know that they came down the aisle yesterday here in church to the music, Love is in the Air. And that was wonderful, but actually, their status changed two weeks ago, when in a church in Glasgow, The minister at one point in the wedding service turned to them and said, I now pronounce you husband and wife. What did that declaration do? It declared what wasn't there before. A marriage. It made public the status of a new relationship. So when we trust Christ, We are given a new righteous status before God, which changes our lives forever. God declares us right with him, in the clear, free from the fear of future judgment. We don't have to wait for God's verdict on us. We have it now. We already know what that public declaration is. God says, you are mine. I have died for you. So my friends, when we trust Christ, we can live with confidence now because our accusing conscience is silenced by the blood of Jesus. He died for me. He was forsaken that I might be forgiven. That's why the gospel is good news. That's why it's powerful The gospel saves in the present and forever sinners who are facing judgment. So, if our response to Jesus before judgment day determines his response to us on judgment day, have you responded? Have we said to him, I will trust you with my life, with my hopes, with my fears, with my guilty conscience, with my future. I will trust you. Let's pray. Father, we want to hear again your invitation to us as sinners, as those who know that we are facing judgment, your invitation to repent and believe the gospel, the powerful good news of your son Jesus, the judge who was judged in our place. And thank you that we can leave the building this morning, go have tea and coffee and talk to people, uh, trusting in Jesus and therefore confident that you have Pronounce that verdict over our lives that changes our lives forever. We are free to go. Because of Jesus, we are in the clear, forgiven forever by your grace. So may we live with that kind of boldness this coming week. And may our hearts be assured that our guilty consciences have been cleansed by Jesus, our great high priest, in whose name we pray, amen.